Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar titled Lighting Retrofits, Considerations, Strategies, and Solutions. The current market has stringent energy codes, prevalent controls usage, and dwindling utility incentives, which may lead you to ask yourself, how cost-effective are lighting retrofit projects? So whether you are currently doing lighting retrofits or considering getting into this type of work, today's presentation will help you better understand successful strategies for today's market. In this presentation, we'll cover topics including who are the current industry players? What are the best retrofit strategies? What type of solution makes the best economic sense and will work best for your customer? How to audit best practices and verify existing conditions? Solution comparisons to deliver a great payback and improve the lighted environment. And finally, we'll conclude with the, the presentation with a Q&A session um, to answer any questions you may have. So now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Mr. Frank Agraz. Frank has worked in the energy efficient lighting community for over 25 years and currently serves as director of the CNI Engineering Department at Eco Engineering. He also serves on the Illuminating Engineering Society Board of Directors as vice president. At this time, I'm pleased to turn it over to Frank Agraz to begin his presentation. There you go. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, whole world of, of uh, lighting retrofits. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Really, it's about considerations, strategies, and solutions. Um, we're going to take you through a, a little, little bit of, of, uh, of how we work in the lighting retrofit world. Uh, we're going to go through uh, expertise within our industry and kind of the who's who. Uh, we're going to talk about success and what that means to our customers when they evaluate lighting retrofits. Uh, we're going to look at the evaluation process itself uh, to better understand uh, the metrics and uh, what's going to allow a customer to say yes. We're going to dive into some of the solutions and from the designer uh, developer point of view, uh, better understand what's out there and what's going to work and how can we align our solution with what the customer needs and wants. Uh, we're going to take a look at best practices from the auditing point of view, uh, because this is uh, less than an hour presentation. Uh, you know, I kind of had to narrow my, my focus a little bit. So we're going to focus on the audit side of, of, the, uh, of the equation here. And then uh, last but not least, I want to take a look at uh, a, a few little um, um, kind of funny uh, things that I've run into during my career and basically simply titled, what were they thinking? So uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, when we talk about expertise, um, I wanted to point out the fact that when someone says I'm in lighting uh, and the customer hears that this person who's now talking to them is in lighting, uh, it really comes from uh, a, a few different, a few different areas. Um, one group of, of folks in the lighting community um, are what I would refer to as material-based folks. Uh, these are the manufacturers, uh, the rep agencies, and the distributors. Um, you know, without them, we would not have a lighting retrofit. Right? These are the folks who make the products, and in turn, when they're you know selling and recommending, oftentimes they are doing so based on what's in their inventory. And, um, and what is it that they're incentivized to sell? Uh, the next bucket of, of lighting folks are um, on the service side of it. These could be architects, uh, MEP firms, designers, uh, ESCOs, consultants, uh, even folks on, on the utility side. I, I mentioned them because uh, many times we're going to uh, the utility for an incentive or a rebate. And these folks are just as incentivized to, 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 to give away their, their pot of money. And so they're going to reach out to um, those providers as well as customers themselves to try to spend that budget. Um, I did want to point out a, a, a term here that you may have heard of uh, with respect to the term ESCO, uh, Energy Savings Company. Um, I have it broken out here as two different forms because that term has seemed to have evolved over time. Um, what I refer to as a traditional ESCO are those folks like Johns Controls, Honeywell, Siemens, um, Amoresco. And these are the ones that provide the performance contracting. 
They're the ones that work with the federal and government entities who typically don't have capital budgets. And they're looking at multiple ways to save energy, not just lighting, but it could be water and building envelope and um, wastewater, steam, things like that. And lighting is just one piece of it. Then you have this other realm of companies that are turnkey ESCOs uh, that typically don't provide financing, although they can. Uh, and these are the ones that do the full service uh, you know, assessment, design, uh, calculations, uh, installation, project management, things like that. So when you hear the word ESCO, just be mindful of, of who's saying the word and, and what they really mean. Um, the third category of, of folks in the lighting community I would refer to as uh, on the labor side. These are the electrical contractors, um, crews that are, are part of the company themselves which we, we refer to as self-performing. And then there's this whole kind of, I don't wanna say hidden, but this, this under the radar network of what I refer to as labor only retrofit crews. And these are folks that do work specifically on the labor only portion. Um, any uh, self-respecting turnkey ESCO who's out there or, or other entity who's trying to develop, develop projects um, outside of their own region is going to look for these labor only retrofit crews to augment their services. So uh, to go from local to regional to national, having a network of labor only crews is uh, very helpful. Within a lighting community, we have quite a few uh, credentials out there. And think of a credential as a badge of, of uh, acknowledgement to your customer and to your peers to show that you have demonstrated a minimal level of competency in a certain area. Um, every uh, uh, little logo you see on the left is the entity, such as NCQLP, the IALD, and so on. And then the little logo to the right is their credential. So many of you have heard of the lighting certified credential from the NCQLP. Um, you may or may not have heard the, of the CLC, the Certified Lighting Consultant from the ALA, or the CEM or CLEP, um, there's a lot of alphabet soup out there. The point is, uh, depending on what your specialty is and where your niche is on, um, on your expertise, getting one of these credentials can be very helpful. Um, I also wanted to kind of explain the, uh, well, not explain, but just kind of show the, all of the, the, the words behind the letters. Uh, we're not going to go through every one of these here, but just know that these entities, uh, many of them have been around for quite some time. Uh, Nelmco which focuses on the maintenance and the management. Um, you know, think of the old bucket trucks when you're changing out you know, light bulbs uh, across convenience stores and shopping malls. Uh, they've been around since the 50s. Uh, lighting designers, the ILD since 69. Um, and then you have some of the newer players like NCQLP in the early 90s and USGBC. So I wanna take a step back for a minute and just explore this whole motivation to buy. Whether you're purchasing a candy bar or a home or a lighting retrofit or anything else, there's three real motivations. There's pain, there's fear, and there's pleasure. And if you are pitching a lighting retrofit to a customer uh, or whatever you're selling, it's always important to know what your customer's motivation is. As respects to lighting, if your customer uh, is getting you know, getting dinged because their electric bills are too high or they have horrible maintenance expenses. Um, if you have identified that as a prime, motiv you know, prime motivator, uh, that's gonna help you to, uh, to deliver the right amount of information to give them an informed decision on what to do next. Uh, same thing with fear and pleasure. Um, the, the point is know why your customer wants to buy uh, and how it is that your solution can help them alleviate whatever condition is here. So let's talk a little bit about measuring success. Um, the Department, Department of Energy put out a nice study of, uh, almost, almost two years ago, and it talked about how solid state lighting uh, is gonna affect energy savings. And they went ahead and performed a forecast. They broke it up into certain different pieces and chunks here, but I wanted to kind of show you three ways that, that they've uh, projected. 
Uh, first one is based on commercial buildings. So think of this as a typical interior um, space. And what you're seeing here is not percentages per se, but actually installed stock of units. And so as you move from 2017 on to, to where we are in 2021 and beyond, the amount of conventional technologies in gray is starting to shrink. What's interesting is are these four buckets of what the end users are, are gonna be moving toward, uh, whether it be uh, lamps, whether it be luminaires or some sort of connectivity. Uh, you know, we've seen now LED lamps with, with Bluetooth uh, connectivity. Uh, obviously on the luminaire side, there's all sorts of, of, uh, of you know, Bluetooth, math, Bluetooth mesh uh, in, in other ways to, uh, to make their systems more intelligent. So just kind of keep in mind that there is quite a bit of, of room left um, to uh, move forward with the retrofit. Um, I just changed the slide here to kind of show the outdoor sector. This is all your exterior, all your poles, your wall packs, your floods. And I got to tell you, the adoption of the exterior has been much faster. And so uh, the percent of customers who have not yet converted is starting to shrink rather quickly. So if you're trying to prioritize your selling efforts, uh, just note that um, the barrel is getting a little, little bit smaller, a little bit tighter. Um, now, because of, of the way that LED has progressed, uh, quite a few have jumped into new fixtures, let's be honest. So um, if you were to take a look at this LED lamp, you know, think corn cobs, think bypass systems. Um, there may be some first gen systems out there where you could step them up to an actual luminaire or better yet go to some sort of connected system. Um, this one takes a look at the actual uh, technologies by lamp type. And uh, you know, going from the top working up, how many T12s are left in the market? How many T8s? How many T5s? Um, if you look at, at this band from the yellow going down, there are still quite a few T8s, T5s, and HIDs in, in this space. Uh, the point to all three of these graphs is to show you that the retrofit market is still incredibly strong. There's a lot of folks who have not yet converted or possibly converted to first generation um, type B or type A TLEDs as an example. Um, we now have the ability to take them to that next level. So for those who may think that the era of retrofitting is gone, um, this information would, would drastically disagree with that. Now, when it comes to a, a retrofit, um, Let's be very honest, right? These folks are investing their capital because they're looking for a return on investment. Um, they're looking for a financial instrument and lighting, by the way, just happens to be the vehicle that generates the savings. Now, when the CFOs and the accountants and those that are looking at the financial side of it, uh, there's different ways that we can evaluate a project. And it's important to know what is going through their mind when they evaluate your, your proposal. Uh, the first metric involved is uh, simple payback. Um, everyone has heard of this. Uh, you know, it's important to know that this is really a function um, of time. Um, return on investment is, is another way to, to evaluate projects. And it's just really the inverse of, of simple payback. So instead of having your net investment divided by savings, your ROI is basically the inverse of that. Now, total cost of ownership is another metric that really focuses on the long-term um, consumption of each project. Um, and so we're gonna dive into a little bit to each one of these, but I just wanted you to kind of keep your eyes. These are the three big ways. So if you're proposing a solution, um, you might wanna have one of these metrics in your documentation so that customers will uh, help to decipher what's, what's in their best interest to move forward with. Now, I bring this slide up because how many times have you heard someone say, this project will deliver an ROI of four years? You know, I hear that and that just makes my, my skin crawl a little bit because it's demonstrating one, they have no idea what ROI is. 
And worse off, if your customer is this savvy, they're gonna know that you don't know what you're talking about. Simple payback is a unit of time. ROI is a unit of percentage. So as, as a project could have a simple payback of four years, but an ROI of 25%. Um, very important, I know it's a little thing, uh, just stop saying ROI with time because it's a little embarrassing. Total cost of ownership is a different metric, which we'll get into, um, but that metric is a function of dollars or money, if you're using Canadian or pesos or whatever. So um, just know and make sure that you line up the metric with the unit. Now, simple payback, uh, you know, basically your net price divided by your savings. There's a lot that goes into this. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but just know that um, the numerator involves costs minus rebate minus potential federal uh, tax incentives like EPACT. And the denominator is not just energy savings per se. It also can involve interactive HVAC savings, uh, deferred maintenance, uh, and potentially even performance non-energy based savings that your customer would agree to. So uh, don't you know, sell yourself short when you're putting together this calculation. Make sure that you and the customer agree on all the variables before you present. Now, we've got uh, a little look here at a way to present information in a typical retrofit project. Uh, what you're seeing here are three different proposals uh, based on a solution strategy. Uh, this first column assumes that um, this retrofit solution will have new luminaires. The second one is going to involve kits. And the last one is going to involve a simple, uh, you know, relamping uh, of using T-LEDs. As you can see, we have different uh, front uh, first time costs for each of them. Um, potentially the rebates are going to be drastically different. Um, energy savings could be a little bit different based on efficacies and other, other metrics. And so when you get to the end of the day, you know, T-LEDs, you know, call it 140 grand with a two-year payback, kits a little more expensive with a three-year payback, and then, you know, new fixtures almost double the price of T-LEDs with almost double the simple payback. So this might be a slam dunk in certain people's eyes, but wait, there's more. Um, depending on your customer situation, if you've got a, a situation where maybe uh, a customer is leasing a space and they're only gonna be in that facility for let's say six or seven years uh, versus someone who is in a building and they know they're gonna be there for a very long time, uh, you might wanna take a longer look at the cost and savings. So what you're seeing here is a total cost of ownership model. Uh, this is assuming a 10 year um, um, ownership look. Um, the column on the left is your baseline. This is assuming that they already have existing T8s. Uh, and as you can see here, there is no blue in the existing line. There's no, there is no upgrade investment. Status quo, they're doing nothing. But over 10 years, you're going to spend this much in energy plus this much in maintenance. Now take a look at each of those three solutions. And there is an upgrade investment, but the reduction in energy and maintenance is so much that it absolutely makes sense to move forward. Now, unlike T-LEDs, where that had the best payback, look which one has the lowest total cost over a 10-year span. It's not the T-LEDs. It's actually the kits. And so if you look at it this through this lens, you will come up with a much different path moving forward than looking just at initial cost. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, TCO is a nice vehicle to explore only when your customer uh, is willing to look at the long-term benefits versus the first time cost. So we're gonna switch gears here for a second. Um, let's kind of evaluate and let's put your, your we're gonna put ourselves in the shoes of um, a lighting designer, a lighting developer. Uh, you've got a customer who's interested and they say, hey, I want to save money. I want to meet my sustainability goals. I need to reduce my maintenance expenses. I need to improve occupant comfort and controls. 
it all starts to these three buckets right here. You got to select the right ECM. And I've narrowed it down to these three basic silos. Uh, one is going with TLEDs, tubular LEDs. Uh, some people call them tubes. Uh, there's a lot of other names for them, but uh, TLED, in a, in a, uh, to, to say it quickly, is going to give you your lowest first cost. Um, and it's going to also preserve that those existing aesthetics, right? You're really not going to change anything because you're using the existing housing. The second silo is uh, is what we will call a kit. You know, a kit is we're using the existing luminaire. We're basically gutting the insides and we're putting something new. And along with that, sometimes comes uh, a better blend of cost and performance than what you would get with the T LED. Versus luminaires, it minimizes the labor expense. And versus T-LEDs, it actually provides potentially a much longer life and warranty. Now, the third silo are luminaires, right? New fixtures. Um, this is great when, you're, when you can redesign the system, if the customer wants a completely new look, or if you're now in an environment where optics and thermal management is critical. Um, maybe the space changed from a warehouse to manufacturing or from an office to some other laboratory, right? There's, there's different times when you need to just completely uh, kind of hit the reset button and design from the ground up. Now, when you take a look at, at project considerations, it's not just about cost. It's not just about, about payback necessarily, but you need to understand those other things that don't really show up on a proposal page. Um, if a customer asked me um, or, or said, hey, I, I want new fixtures everywhere. And I'm maybe pushing back and saying, well, maybe you wanna consider a kit. Here are four reasons why you, a kit might make more sense than a luminaire. Number one, the envir environmental impact. If you're pulling out hundreds and thousands of old fixtures versus just putting a new kit reusing, uh, the amount of additional metal and cardboard waste can be quite dramatic. Second, kits get installed much quicker than new fixtures, right? There's no seismic codes. There's no potential pitfalls when you get into the plenum. Uh, and correspondingly, the disruption to the tenants can be much, much less because you're getting in and out much faster. Uh, and then kind of hand in hand with that, um, extending the overall project schedule means a lot more money, more project management time, higher labor, more time on site. Um, the other thing that may not go into that equation is the fact that with the longer project you have, the longer it takes for those annual savings to start. So a project using kits that may take two months could take four or five months with new fixtures, and now you've just lost two or three months of savings, potentially. You know, what is that worth? And how does that show up in your payback calculations? So just be mindful of which of these silos you're, you're pushing forward. Um, another kind of evaluation of, of kits versus luminaires. Um, and and we're gonna, I'm going to go specifically to a Trafford door kit. Uh, and we'll, we'll show you some photos here in a little bit. But with the Trafford door kit, because you're using the existing luminaire, all the work can be done below the ceiling plane, not only on the installation, but on the service and uh, the maintenance of it. Um, you know, no longer do you have to potentially get above the ceiling. Everything is housed within uh, that cavity um, um, you know, below the ceiling. Uh, a couple other you know, benefits too. Um, it's the same components, installation time is quicker, and your warranty and L70 lifespans can sometimes equal that of a new luminaire. So let's take a, a real world example of, of uh, some solutions and let's kind of compare um, some of the different items. Um, for this particular case, I, uh, uh, I used uh, an, op an open office layout. Uh, we're going to assume that there's a grid of recessed troffers that use three lamp T8 fluorescence. Uh, we're going to assume 4,000 hours and a 14 cent utility rate. Uh, not only are we going to evaluate the wattage and cost price and savings, but we're, I'm also going to throw in variables for controls. And so using that, we're going to come up with a couple different strategies here, whether it be on-off motion, single control, or individual control. 
each with its own percentage of savings and control strategies. Now, there's a lot to look at, so please forgive me, but um, what you're seeing here is, let, let's kind of focus on this first row at the top where there is no control method. What I've done is I've taken my three potential buckets of, of ECMs, T-LEDs, kits, and luminaires, and within each one of those, we have some, some choices. For T-LEDs, it could be a type A, B, or C. Uh, it could be a trough door kit, or it could be some type of, of, of new fixture. And through experience and through what customers have been purchasing within the retrofit space the last few years, I can tell you, for better or for worse, a lot of folks have been honing in on this UL Type B solution. It's quick, it's down and dirty, it's cheap, it gets some savings. But for cost purposes, I'm going to use that as the baseline. And we're going to say that's a 1x on the cost. What if we were to switch to UL type A? I can tell you, using real world numbers as a turnkey ESCO, uh, you're going to spend about 38% more on a type A. There'll be some variance based on who you pick, of course. But um, a type B T-LED versus a new trough versus a trough door kit, you're spending almost twice as much and uh, worth versus new luminaires, you're in that kind of that 2X range. Now let's run that same math again, but let, let's add in a motion sensor, an on off. And so you're gonna spend, you call it, you know, you know, another three fourths of your dollars to add controls. And you can see all the different variants based on what silo you pick. Um, for your zone level and individual controls, you can see the cost adders when those are applied as well. To go from you know, a 2x to a 4x, you're almost doubling your cost when you look at adding individual controls. So this is the kind of, of, of uh, evaluation that we run across. And if we know this up front, we can try to help navigate the customer to, uh, to meet their budgets. So I just switched the slide. I don't know if you caught that or not, but we went from cost to savings. And so now we ran the math all again, but now from the denominator point of view with respect to the savings. Again, type B is going to be a 1x as the baseline. And if you take a look at a, let's say, a, a, a new uh, a basket troffer, you're getting more savings because that luminaire is, has has better efficacy and is saving more watts than a type B. Um, but you're spending quite a bit more on the front end. Uh, this is both material, labor, recycling, dumpsters, project management, the whole, the whole, you know, whole ball of wax here. So when you're looking back and forth, uh, let's get to the end here. Here's your payback. And so when you do the math, this is a nice little cheat sheet you can use when your customer says, well, I want new door kits. Okay, great. Based on the variables that we, I showed you earlier, um, it'll be about a five-year payback, but you could use new fixtures and maybe make it you know, about the same price, or you can go to T-LEDs and get you half as, you know, twice as good of a payback. So again, for better, for worse, these are some of the metrics that, uh, uh, that you need to have in your pocket and to understand uh, those ins and outs of what solution with what control strategy offers what type of payback. Um, another thing that, that we like to do is to uh, sometimes evaluate and understand how sensors can affect a project. Uh, in the old days, if you had you know, T12s or T8s and you, and, and you went back to a, a new solution, um, adding a sensor would almost certainly improve the payback. But today with such a low existing baseline, uh, with this race to zero watts, uh, and with the relative cost and in, in, in labor being unchanged, sometimes putting in sensors to improve a payback sometimes just isn't there. And so let, kind of let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, if we're controlling 120 watts, 
and that could be in four fixtures, that could be in one, it could be a circuit, it could be a, 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 some other strategy. Uh, it doesn't really matter. If you're controlling 120 watts and you're spending $100 to control those watts, uh, whether it be at the switch or a power pack or whatever the situation is, and you have a 12 cent rate, and you're looking to do better than a five-year payback, what you're seeing here are the combinations of existing hours and sensor savings required to do better than five years. So as an example, if you're running 12 hours a day, five days a week, and you can save at least 50% of your, of your wattage, this, this scenario will, will give you a 4.4 year payback. But in that same situation, if you're only running eight hours a day, five days a week, and only saving 40%, you're now at a, over an eight year payback. So this type of you know, analysis really does require you to know what your hours are, what your percent savings is. Um, I built this just because I'm kind of a, a geeky Excel nerd. But uh, if you wanted a copy of this, I'll be happy to send it to you. you kind of play around with it. It's kind of interactive. Um, so just reach out to Christine and the, and the group, and I'll be happy to send this along to you. So let's get, uh, let's get to it. Um, let's take a look at some of these retrofit solutions and why our customers would say yes. We're going to go back to these initial three buckets here. Uh, the first one is T-LEDs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you're looking to retrofit uh, some sort of linear fluorescent system, whether it be T12, T8, or T5, this UL type A, B, or C is the direction that a lot of people go. Um, UL type B is going to be a, a kind of a bypass. Type A is also known as ballast compatible. Type C uses a remote driver. Um, they also do have this universal which is types A and B. Uh, I'm gonna jump to this one because this gets a little bit more of the attributes. Um, just know that the, these different um, UL types do have different names. So uh, again, ballast compatible, direct wire, remote driver. Uh, you may have heard of um, um, ballast bypass as well. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll kind of skip over this, but just know that you just can't say TLED, right? You have to understand which one is which. Um, not only are our TLEDs have different UL types, but the component and construction can vary as well. Uh, keep in mind that um, nowadays most TLEDs are made of the same sort of uh, glass construction that most linear fluorescents are made of. Um, some of the older styles, and some of them are still out there, have this kind of plastic aluminum form factor, which if you're not seeing as being proposed today, you may see them in the field when you're doing assessment. So it's important to see and understand both types. Um, one other attribute of these two different types is how light is distributed. If you have the glass type, you're going to much more closely mimic the 360 degree uh, output of a, of a traditional fluorescent. Uh, this plastic aluminum, because of the way that uh, it's shielded, light's really only coming out of, out of one side of it. So you're getting even less than 180 degrees. So keep that in mind. Um, another interesting thing about T-LEDs is, um, as with most LEDs, is that they love the cold. So um, unlike linear fluorescence, T8s and T5s that start to uh, decrease their lumen output in colder ambient temperatures, uh, T LEDs actually get even a, a tiny bit brighter as they get colder. So, um, you know, make sure you understand the ambient temperatures that are involved. Um, T LEDs, again, um, as long as you're operating within the, the temperature range as on the spec sheet, you should be good. Um, but just know that this could give you a much drastic lumen and foot candle bump um, depending on what that uh, ambient environment is. A couple of little notes on T-LEDs. Um, if you're using a UL type A, you may have this kind of nominal lamp wattage, but that's really not what you're gonna be getting at all. 
uh, with a type A because it depends on the ballast factor. So putting in a low normal or high ballast factor system is going to alter both the system wattage and the lumen output. So you just can't take 1800 lumens and run with it. What ballast am I putting it on? And how does that affect both these attributes here? Uh, one other little caveat on the oil type A, uh, I said the word ballast compatible. Um, what you're seeing here is a ballast compatibility chart. This is extremely important if you're going to uh, um, recommend a plug and play solution, meaning you're going to take out that linear fluorescent and put in a T lead. Um, in my opinion, that's a little dangerous because do you really know 100% of the ballasts that are in that existing system? Um, the reality is not every manufacturer's type A T lead works with every other manufacturer's linear fluorescent ballast. If you are going to go type A, I highly recommend for you to replace the lamp and the ballast. Um, that being said, I'm not a big fan of type A's anyway, uh, much less T LEDs, but um, um, just kind of be forewarned if you're going to go down that road, there are a lot of issues potentially. Uh, another thing too, with respect to sockets, um, the T LED industry has made some, some inroads, but um, just know that shunted versus non-shunted sockets can, can be an issue. So make sure you, you read your, your spec sheet and installation instructions. Um, we're going to take a look at different types of, of kits here. Uh, when someone says retrofit kit, what do you really mean? Well, it depends on the application. Here's a cross-section of downlight kits and what they could look like. There are light bar kits that don't use, uh, don't, you, don't use lamp holders. There are board kits that's a little more of a stripped down version of, uh, of, of reducing the wattage. There are conversion strip kits, which will fit right real neatly into a four and a quarter inch uh, um, channel strip. There are high bay kits. And although these aren't made uh, as much today, again, they are in lighting systems today. If you're doing an audit, you're doing an assessment, you need to know what's going on. There are plate kits, same thing. This is back, I'm dating myself a little bit, but this is in the old days. Not many folks use it, but you need to know that it's out there. Troffer door kits, very popular. Troffer reflector kits. Uh, for the metal benders that used to sell troffer reflectors, guess what? They threw some strips on it. Um, this is now an option as well. Um, luminaires, way too many to go into today, but I just wanted to point out something. Uh, traditional high bays and what we would call a low bay on the right side of your screen uh, were pretty much unchanged for, for many, many years. Uh, then LEDs came along, they opened up uh, the creative mind of manufacturers and look what they came up with. I'm just amazed uh, at how our industry generated solutions for high base applications. Um, it's pretty cool to see you just kind of you know, you throw them something and they come up with, you know, 18 million different ways to do it. So uh, it's very uh, ex exciting times we live in. So I'm going to run through just kind of some best practice from, from the audit and data collection point of view. Uh, number one, always fill out a pre-audit questionnaire. Understand what's going on before you get to, the, the, uh, before you get to, your, to your site. Understand the facility, uh, what type of utility is, is involved design considerations, uh, and what happens if you win the job on the installation side. You should be asking questions um, before, uh, before you win the job. Understand your replacement stock. There's usually a closet that has uh, replacement parts. Know what it is, take pictures of it, ask questions. Um, it's important to collect the right amount of, of detail. Uh, location, room numbers, uh, descriptions, wattages, hours, uh, light levels. There's a lot of things that you want to collect, not just how many lights are in the, in, in the system. Uh, it's important to have the right uh, tool bag, uh, light meters, uh, make sure you have the right PPE, always carry a good flashlight. Um, ballast frequency checker is really nice too, whether it's the old school flicker checker or the newer discriminator. 
again, I wish I had more time to demo all the stuff, but uh, um, there's a lot of good in, uh, tools that you should have in, in your bag when you're, when you're in the field. Uh, one of the most important things is to have a map. Um, have them send it to you ahead of time. Uh, this is a typical uh, you know, laminated one that I saw on the wall. Uh, if you have the right computer software, you can then digitally assign map pins uh, to each space to better um, figure out and, and, and detail what's there. I mean, heck, even if you don't have a computer software, put it down, right? Write it down. Make sure you have a good understanding of, of what's what. Same thing goes for exterior. Um, let's figure out where the wall packs and the floods and the poles and, and everything else is so that your installation team can uh, know where they're going. Um, you know, as an auditor, you want to audit in layers. Make sure that you are capturing everything. and Don't be overwhelmed when you run into a space. Uh, just take it one at a time. Photos are very important. Uh, we want to um, really capture what's there, not just from a cell phone or tablet, right? Anybody can take this shot. And that's a good start. But what you really want to do is capture the space that's being lighted. How is that fixture mounted? And if you can, with the, an amazing camera, get that ballast plate. Give me the watts, give me the voltage, make sure that there's no, uh, no surprises. Same thing with exterior. What's being lighted? How is it mounted? Uh, and you know, with a good, uh, good camera, you can actually zoom in and capture the wattage off the lamp from uh, you know, 20, 25 feet up. Same thing with your breaker panels. Uh, we need to know what's there and, and understand uh, how it's being powered. When you are confirming voltage, uh, you know, try to get the ballast label, open up fixtures. If you can't do that, go to your panel and confirm there. Um, as a third uh, way to do it, um, go to your material stock. Maybe there's enough corroborating evidence that gets you a little bit of a confirmation. And the absolute last thing to do is to ask the maintenance crew. They will be wrong as much as they swear up and down. Uh, they're a very unreliable source of voltage. Um, from the auto perspective, be observant, ask questions. Why are there shields on, on, on my floods? What the heck's AIB? And if they're inspecting something, does their inspection include lighting? What are those little numbers that say 20? Well, how does that work? Um, is there a utility rep that works with your company? Maybe they have rebate dollars that they're trying to get rid of. Get their name and number. Why is that floodlight pointed so weird up there? Did somebody mess up or is there something I need to know about? Same thing, ask questions. Why is there an LED next to a, a, a metal halide? Is there another vendor in here? Are they doing a mock-up? Am I just the third bidder? Um, what's going on? Um, same thing on the installation side, whether you've got cord and plug or you've got a power at each fixture or you're using a relock system, uh, anything you can do to tighten up your labor bid will help you win the project. Hours of operation are very important too. Uh, I'll just say that um, the way you calculate the hour, the number of hours in a year is 24 hours a day times 365 days a year. That gets you your 8760. Um, another way to do it, which is a little more wrong, is to do, uh, was it 24 hours a day times um, seven days a week times 52 weeks? And if you do that, you get a different number. Customers who are savvy are going to know if you use 8760 or 8736. Don't be the 8736 guy because you might get embarrassed. Um, folks who pay attention to the details know this. You as a lighting practitioner, calculate it the right way, demonstrate your proficiency. Um, accurate data collection is important, right? Whether you're doing it on a on a, on a tablet back in 2002, the way I was, when everybody else was using paper, um, you know, make sure you have a process in place, make sure that you are capturing the data. If you think it might take a day to be there, make it two days. 
right? Don't rush your data collection. Make sure it's, it's, it's correct. So I'm going to sum it up with uh, a couple of uh, interesting slides here. Um, this may not really reach out to you as, as you're seeing it, but the first thing I think of is why did they put the lighting above, above their, their, their kind of their racking system? Uh, why did they spec out a highway with uplight in this situation? Um, you know, there's a lot of watts wasted in this scenario. Uh, sometimes in the, in the architect world, when they're building new construction, the lighting design doesn't really talk to the folks that are putting in the equipment. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, messages and, and information gets lost. So uh, not, you know, they could have done much better than, the, than what I'm saying here. Uh, this one is just wrong for so many reasons. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're smiling the way I am. Um, just retrofit people do stupid things and customers will, will sign off on it. Um, uh, we can do much better than this. Uh, we can fix this and we can make sure that we're lighting up the environment properly. Um, on a retail space, I'm sure some um, architect or some, some lighting practitioner thought it was great to put high pressure sodium uh, in a retail space. Uh, maybe perhaps because their lumen output was higher than other white light sources on a spec sheet. And then ironically, the good lighting is, is in the back of the house where the cashier is. So what's, what's up with that? Um, you know, sometimes people just don't really think. Um, we've got a black, black ceiling here and that, that poor little cove lighting is doing its best, but um, not, not really... Um, not, not really, uh, you know, uh, getting the light out, but let's put it that way. Uh, sometimes there's uh, too much light. Uh, classic case of the ability to redesign and remove fixtures out of the design. Um, customers just do silly, crazy things because they just don't know any better. Sometimes you, you need to write down in your audit and give uh, account for extra labor. How are you going to get into the space? How are you going to replace uh, and, and how are you going to get your lifts around here? Um, make sure you document, make sure you write it down, make sure you have the proper labor number so that you don't uh, lose your hat uh, if they award you the job. Sometimes fixtures get dirty. Um, make sure you're specking out the right luminaire for the right application. And then I'll leave you with this. Um, this is a border crossing station. Uh, in Texas. And what you're seeing here at the bottom, I'm, it's hard to see, but there's a, there's a young man here with a, with, with a canine. And this is what we call secondary inspection. Um, the lighting practitioner who designed the space decided to go with the mix of high pressure sodium and metal halide uh, in these surface mounted uh, you know, boxes. And then we have these 1000 watt metal halide on, on the columns pointing up. Uh, they had less than five foot candles. Actually, it was a lot lower than that. And this is secondary inspection where they're looking for drugs and contraband and everything else. So they brought me in. Uh, I took a look at it and I said, we need to do better. Uh, ripped everything out, uh, went back with uh, um, uniform, high CRI, uh, linear fluorescent at the time and bumped up their you know, light levels from less than five to about, I think it was like 30 or 35. Um, so anyway, uh, just don't think you have to replace with what's there. Uh, think outside the box and try to do what's best for the customer and what's right for the application and the task being performed. That's all I got. Uh, I will um, stop talking and, and open it up for questions. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for the interesting and educational presentation. Um, I definitely learned a lot of valuable information and strategies and enjoyed all of the photos, especially those at the end. Um, so yeah, we'd like to open up for any questions from the viewers and uh, please use the chat function um, in Zoom to write your questions for Frank and uh, just give you a few moments to develop the question.
So Frank, while people are uh, trying to decide if they have any other questions for you, um, I guess we will have to have you back on for uh, a demo for all those um, audit kits that you had. I don't know if you have a way to pop back onto that slide, but that list seemed pretty extensive. Um, Aparna is asking for a spreadsheet. Aparna, can you be specific? Did you write down a page number or anything? But um, yeah, thanks so much, Frank. That was really informative. We really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us today. And uh, if we don't have any other questions, um, we can wrap it up a little bit early. Um, I have some announcements for everyone. So Aparna, can you let us know which spreadsheet or do you wanna just ask Frank directly? Oh, yeah, so the spreadsheet that he commented on was, um, it was like the cheat sheet for uh, the, um, I think it was like the different uh, paybacks. Yeah, I, I think what you're referring to is the incremental uh, simple payback calculator for Correct. motion sensors. Correct. I'll be happy to send that along. Okay. That yeah, was really, very good. Excellent. Other announcements are that, of course, we have the uh, IES Raleigh Section Illumination Awards coming up. So the deadline for that is November 26th. So don't wait until Turkey Day, get it done sooner. And it's for all North Carolina companies and individuals um, are welcome to submit a project that's been completed since January 1st of 2019. So you have a little bit of ways that you can go back on that one. Um, we do have the flyer available on um, the latest newsletter. And I think it's on the website as well for our um, illuminating awards, illumination awards website page. So that's raleigh.ies.org slash awards. And that should take you directly to the page. And if you do have any other further questions, you can um, contact Turquoise Shaw and uh, I will get you in touch with her if you need her email. Um, also, I wanted to mention before everybody pops off, we are going to do something uh, later in the month, a in person on Saturday, November 20th. Um, mark your calendars for the Knights of Lights. It's a 5K run walk at 6.30 p.m. at Dorothea Dix Park. We'd love to see you there. It's for IES members, um, their family members, friends. Um, anyone's invited to walk as a group and enjoy the lights together at this community holiday event. Um, and if you would like to attend, you do need to purchase tickets separately. And then there's a sign up. Um, Caitlin Ryder is running the sign up for that. So it looks like, Frank, we do have one more question. Uh, the question is, do you run into Flickr very much with type B lamps? Sounds like the door kit is popular. Can you comment? That came from Bob. So Frank, do you mind popping back on and answering Bob's question? Not at all. Um, thanks for the question, Bob. Uh, the answer is, to, is no, we don't run into Flickr very often with type B lamps. Uh, it, it can happen, as you know, with any solid state lighting source. Um, the, the, the folks who make T LEDs and especially the Type Bs, I, I think have kind of, I would say, stepped up their game in the last two, three years. Uh, they now have double ended um, connectivity um, and that, that does reduce uh, some, of, some of the issues. Um, with respect to the door kits, um, that does seem to be a very, very popular um, solution for, for troffers because you are getting, uh, like I said, the best of both worlds. You're getting the, the extended L70 life, sometimes uh, seven and 10 year warranties, uh, and you're getting the cost effectiveness of a much faster install than new fixtures. So uh, trapper door kits are, um, are very popular right now, both in static and air handling situations as well. So, um, and then as a bonus, you get to, to pitch all of that nasty uh, 18 cell parabolic louver um, solutions that are out there. So um, to, to go from that to volumetric uh, in many cases it is a win-win. Okay, thanks, Frank. We have one other question coming in here that just popped in. What is the trend in T-LEDs? What direction is the industry moving to for them? And that came from Aparna. So 
kind of good news, bad news is, good news is, I guess, T-LEDs are everywhere, price is coming down, um, their quality is improving. Bad news is T-LEDs are here. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's amazing as we got toward the toward the tail end of, of the peak of, of linear fluorescent, um, you know, these lamps were, were getting into average rated lives of, I remember 60, 70, even 80,000 hours. And now T LEDs are lucky to last have an L70 of 50,000. And so um, I, you know, it, so the trend is people are installing them by the millions. Um, and, you know, I guess that's an opportunity for, for us in the lighting community um, to, to be there waiting as these T-LEDs fail. The bad news is they've kind of already, um, they, they've taken all the savings, right? If you've got a, a nine or 10 watt T-LED, when you used to have a 32 watt, you know, linear fluorescent T8, there's not much you can do from the energy side of the story to justify a replacement. Um, but hopefully as we move into non-energy benefits, as we get demand for dimming, for color changing and other little things that we can do, um, we can move them out of T-LEDs into uh, a, a, a solid state solution that, um, that's gonna be much, much more robust than what they have now. Yeah, Frank, I think that's a good point. And I think that you know, keeping TM30 in mind, for example, right? So it's not just about, do you have white light, but what kind of white light do you have, right? So I, I designed a product that's in the market that had a very nice, rich color to it. You can imagine what color that was. And, uh, and that color included a very high, beautiful um, produce that you would buy in a certain department of the uh, the back of the grocery store. And so, you know, you are buying a nice salmon, for example, or you're buying a nice steak. You don't want it to look purple or yellow, right? So you, you can get, get where I'm going here, but there's also people, and it's not just about rich colors, but we also have all this talk about daylight quality, right? And, you know, some people hinted at light fair on a certain spectrum missing, right? And so it's not, it's not the energy story necessarily always, but it's, you know, what's the quality of light that you're putting someplace? Because yes, you can just, you know, pop out a fluorescent and pop in an LED tube, or you can pop in an LED tube for another LED tube. But, you know, what's that work environment going to be like for the people, right? Are they going to miss that good quality light, right? That good spectrum of light. So, you know, we have to move beyond the discussion of watts for watts. And how much you know energy can I save? And to get people back in the office, I think we need to make the office, for example, you know, a lot more beneficial from a lighting perspective too. We nobody wants to live in a dark cave anymore, right? That that's a very very good points. Yeah, it's you know we in the in the retrofit community are sometimes kind of handcuffed by our our customers' expectations of I need a two year payback, right? I need you know, it's, it's always from this financial lens and anything we can do to educate them on, on attributes other than just, you know, reading the electric bill and reading the meter, uh, there's gotta be other things that come into play. And, uh, and if, you, you've, if you've got the right customer, you can put in all those other things and, and really improve the lighted space. That's right. Cause we're not lighting office chairs. We're lighting for our people, right? Or we're not lighting for boxes. We should, you know, be lighting for the people that are going to be using the space. That's it. Great. Greg, do you have anything um, you wanted to add? We are after one o'clock. We should probably wrap up or Perna or Bob. All right. Well, we will um, close it up. Yes. Aparna. Sorry. It was excellent. Thank you so much. I forgot that my mute was on. So appreciate it very much. And I look forward to getting the presentation afterwards as well as the spreadsheet. All right, thanks again, Frank. And thank you to all of our members who joined us today. We of course couldn't do this without you. So we are very thankful that you're here today and we hope to see you uh, on November 20th or at uh, in January for our next education event.
Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a good one.